Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome to day two of Thriving in the Face of Cancer. I'm your host, Chef AJ. Today's incredible guest needs no introduction. He is a multiple New York Times bestselling author, a cancer researcher, and all around superstar. Please welcome Dr. William Lee. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know how busy you are. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks, Chef AJ. It's always a pleasure to be speaking with you, even under these circumstances. Well, thank you. And I'm going to ask you what might be a weird question, but Dr. Lee, are you a person that's ever done jigsaw puzzles? And if so, do you enjoy them? Yes, I have done jigsaw puzzles. Do I um, enjoy them? I think I do because I like to solve pu puzzles. And I think that um, the analogy of jigsaw puzzle solving and um, my work as a cancer researcher is always to find those missing pieces. And sometimes they're not the ones that they're not the they're not the ones that you think, number one. So you got to look at the edges very carefully. And secondly, sometimes the solutions are hidden in plain sight and you just didn't pick up that piece that was right in front of your face. Great. Well, thank you. And the reason I asked you that is I too enjoy jigsaw puzzles, but no matter how hard I try, I've never been able to solve one that was more than 300 pieces or one that had small pieces. For Christmas, mm. my friends Leslie and Gerald gave me this puzzle. It's a thousand pieces in all white. And it was a perfect oh. gift because it reminds me, this is how I feel being diagnosed with cancer. Okay, so uh, I think it's time for you to get to it, start solving it. It's uh, definitely solvable. Great, well, maybe we should start out with, maybe you saying, what is lung cancer and how is it diagnosed? Okay, well, um, you know, uh, there's two answers to that. <clears throat> one is a traditional answer, and one is the modern answer, <clears throat> which I think everyone who is dealing with cancer should know about. So, you know, the traditional definition of lung cancer is an abnormal group of cells that form a mass called a tumor that develops in the lung, and that's why we call it lung cancer. And for many years, um, we would look at cancer as <clears throat> being from the organ of origin, lung cancer being in the lung, breast cancer in the breast, brain tumors being in the brain, so on and so forth. And from that, lots of different um, ways of diagnosing it under the microscope and lots of ways of treating it using guidelines, primarily done by clinical trials, which are basically formal ways of testing a treatment to see if it works or not, um, would uh, uh, lead to kind of a recipe book of how to actually treat an organ in a particular uh, a, a cancer in a particular organ, in your case, lung cancer. Um, and that's the way oncology cancer medicine has been practiced for decades. I would say <clears throat> literally dating back to the 50, 1950s. And perhaps um, in this uh, conversation we'll get to a little bit of the history that I think is so interesting about chemotherapy. What are some questions that a patient diagnosed with cancer should be asking their doctor? You know, you, uh, people ask, well, what kind of cancer is it? You know, lung cancer, brain cancer, breast cancer. You, you, you know, it gives us not, not knowing where it comes from or not having a name for it makes it scarier. Once you know what kind it is, <clears throat> that actually gives you a little bit more, hmm, confidence that you can ask the next question. The next question would be, you know, um, what do I need to do to treat it? Or it could be, how bad is it? You know, I think most people aren't medical people. They don't have, <clears throat> now it's true. Like if you have a, you have a cell phone, you could actually, you could ask chat GPT that question at the same time you're in front of the doctor. But you know, the, the, I guess the second question people ask is like, well, like how bad is it? And you know, I have to say, cancer is usually uh, presented both to doctors and to patients as stages. Stage one, two, three, four, they all mean something a little bit different. Stage four is more aggressive and more widespread than stage one. But, you know, that's a scary technical kind of um, concept. And the, the more adventure stages, the more doomed, you know, like you might think you are. And that's why I sort of try not to get people focused on the stage. But they do ask the question, <clears throat> then what is the treatment? And the answer to the treatment, um, like, like most oncologists, I'm an internal medicine doctor and a cancer researcher. So the answer I give may be different than what some oncologists gives. Most oncologists are beholden to their 
hospital or medical center or their practice to be able to give you the guideline of what has been studied that is approved or okay for a particular type of cancer. If you get a lung cancer, if it's stage three, you do this. If it's stage two, you do this. If it's stage one, you do this. Same deal with breast cancer or colon cancer or ovarian cancer. <clears throat> based on the stage, based on what it looks like under the microscope, maybe based on some of the markers, this is what the guidelines actually say. So guidelines are really important because they give us a body, they give us some recommendations based on clinical studies. Like those are really helpful to do, have had done that research to know what works and what doesn't work. And so thank goodness we've got guidelines. So I'm curious, are there specific dietary approaches that cancer patients should consider? Yeah, this is such an important topic for us to um, share with the viewers. Every cancer patient I've ever known uh, has, after they say, what do I have? How bad is it? What's the treatment? Uh, uh, they, they might put their coat on and walk out the door, then they pop their head back in and they always say, hey doc, what is there, what should I be, what can I be doing for myself? What should I be eating? Is there something I should be doing? Is there a supplement I should be taking? Every cancer patient says that. If not at the first visit, then definitely at the second visit. And this is something that people talk about uh, outside of the doctor's office, you know, and start researching online. And unfortunately, and this is a situation I hope will change in the near future. But unfortunately, most oncologists say, eh, it doesn't really matter what you do. There's no magic food. Um, just don't lose any weight. Just keep those calories in. And, you know, like I, I've literally heard, go out and eat some fast food. You know, now's the time for you to eat the worst food that, you know, you tried to avoid and just enjoy yourself. But just make sure you don't lose weight. And nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing. I mean, that, is, well, you know, in... 25 years, 20 years, okay, from now, we're going to be looking at back at recordings of people saying that and going, oh my God, I have no, I, I, can you imagine how ignorant that actually was? All right. Because we now know so much better. And like, there are those of us who work in food as medicine and cancer research. So that's the Venn, might have been diagrams that go together where it's very clear diet does matter. What we put into our body, it's going to affect how our body responds and what we put inside it. And remember, this is about shields up. You want your immune system to be strong, to respond to treatment. You need to eat foods that support your immune system as opposed to take your immune system down. All right. Um, what are things, foods that, that support your immune system? Well, guess what? The things that you can find in the grocery store. You don't have to be a billionaire, a one percenter to actually find blueberries and green tea and walnuts uh, and leafy green vegetables uh, and tomatoes and onions like uh, and garlic and capers and it's not just in the produce section sometimes they're in the middle aisles beans dark chocolate like the darker the chocolate the better um, uh, uh, lentils i mean you know dried mushrooms uh, extra virgin olive oil. But, you know, oncologists don't seem to know this because at the infusion center where they are doing the chemotherapy, the vending machine has nothing but Doritos and M&Ms and Snickers. <laughs> and, you know, and I took a picture of it, Dr. Lee. I posted it on Instagram and Facebook and I tagged the hospital and it got to the CEO and they've asked me to be on the nutrition advisor report. <laughs> good, good for you. Good for you and good for them. I mean, listen, I, I have to say, um, uh listen we we live in a um remarkable world where yesterday's breakthroughs and innovations and creating ultra processed foods and quick and cheap and convenient foods you know now we're beginning to discover 70 50 years later like you know that wasn't such a good idea and so we need to change and i think that you know that's the great opportunity in front of us as a society is to actually link hands and all agree that we should actually do better when it comes to our nutrition and our diet and our food system. So I'm part of that as well. But I will also tell you that on an individual level, listen, you know, you got your, 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 you got your hands full uh, dealing with your cancer. Try to eat the best possible things. Whole plant-based foods are really where you should be going. There's no special advantage over raw, but when you eat things with dietary fiber, think about celery, broccoli, 
uh, 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 any of those leafy greens, plenty of dietary fiber, but even soft foods have dietary fiber. Did you know that mushrooms have dietary fiber? I can't think of anything softer than a cooked mushroom. Oh, I can. Avocado. Avocados packed with dietary fiber. I love avocado. I've been adding a okay. lot lately. Those, that fiber will feed your gut bacteria. They are like little, you know, it's a picture of a, a robin's nest with the little babies with their mouth open, cheap, 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 looking for mom to bring some worms to them, right? Like that's what your gut bacteria are. When you feed, when you bring that fiber to them, they are so happy. They can't wait to actually be fed by mom. And so that's you. You are feeding your gut bacteria. And when they're, when those little baby bacteria, those little baby bird bacteria in your gut, the 40, 39 trillion of them are happy. You know what they do? They pay you back by releasing short chain fatty acids and other beneficial metabolites, get into your bloodstream. And you know what that does? That lowers your immune or inflammation. Wow, you just pulled the rug out of the cancer a little bit. And now it, they also boost your immune system because 70% of your immune system is in your gut, in the wall of your gut. And your bacteria talk to your immune system like roommates talking to each other to order a pizza in college through a cheap dorm wall. Like, hey, what do you want? What do you want in your pizza? Like so you can talk right back, right through the wall. That's how our bacteria and our immune system talk. So if I could recommend one key thing, only one key thing to start your focus on, there's a lot you could do. I mean, please, you know, check out my YouTube channel, Dr. William Lee, L-I. Uh, check out my books, Eat to Beat Disease. Even I'll Eat to Beat Your Diet as well has a lot about anti-inflammation, which is very important for fighting cancer. Check those things out. And, you know, there's a lot of other really good resources. I know you're going to bring some of these people on your show. But I will tell you, if you focus on one thing, start with good gut health, start with dietary fiber, start with eating prebiotic foods, which is eating the rainbow. Okay, that's a good start that you can do right after you hear this program. Oh, my God. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. You're just very inspiring. You've given me hope, you know. You have such a great attitude about this, that it's not necessarily a death sentence. Look, uh, I went to medicine. I went, into, I went to medical school because I wanted to join um, the effort that we've had for forever in humanity to try to learn medicine to help our fellow people. You know, I wanted to figure out how do we conquer, how do we help people with cancer, heart disease, stroke, blindness, diabetes, arthritis. I mean, you name it. And I wound up developing a career looking at common denominators of disease and common denominators of health. And it turns out that food is a common denominator solution. It's not the only solution and it's not really a standalone solution. Even, you know, even if, if you eat the healthiest possible, you still got to exercise. You still got to sleep. You still got to stress manage. You know, there's all kinds of other things, you know, and even if you ate just a perfect diet, but you didn't, do, you know, there's all these other things that can happen to us um, uh, that can influence whether or not we have a um, weakness uh, in our health defenses. What message of hope would you share with somebody who's currently facing a cancer diagnosis? That's an easy one for me. Okay. Um, what I would say is as a doctor and a cancer researcher, and as somebody who's been working at the frontiers of cancer research, there's reason for real hope. I have seen cancer patients who would have had zero chance of surviving 10 years ago, even five years ago, being complete survivors, stage four to stage zero back to health, from the end stages of disease to back to complete vibrant health. And by the way, one of those people is my own mother, who I was involved with her treatment. So I know it works. Well, Dr. Lee, thank you, because you've given me so much hope. Because like when, when you hear stage three, it's like, I mean, the only thing could be worse is stage four, right? <laughs> and remember what I just told you. Yep. People are going from stage four to stage zero. You know, we are rewinding the clock on this. And so, again, I never thought I would see this kind of thing happen in my career, in the time of my career. But there you have it. You know, things are advancing. We don't know how to do it for everybody yet, but everybody deserves a shot at that. That's, that's the most important thing to me.